lot of changes have taken place in media ownership and um, in media economics and uh, technological changes, obviously, in the news media that I think have brought us to, and when I say us, I mean not just the media, but Americans, to a crossroads in terms of the future of the news media in this country. On the, on the good side of the balance sheet um, uh, is, are, the, are the facts that the best um, news media are better than they ever were before. Uh, staffs of newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times are larger than ever before. Uh, we have uh, better educated, more expert people working for us than ever before. We literally have lawyers covering the law and doctors covering medicine. That's not a requirement, but we have we've found journalists who are physicians and lawyers who can help us cover in those areas. Uh, where we don't have that kind of expertise built into a member of our staff, we send them off to gain it. Uh, uh, people who win a foreign assignment, say, in Moscow uh, or Beijing, uh, spend a year at our expense at a university. Uh, um, some have been out here to Stanford, for instance, and Berkeley, uh, or at Sice, Johns Hopkins. Uh, not only learning the language of where they're going, if they don't already know it, they brush up on it, but also uh, you know, deepening their knowledge of the subject that they're, they're going to be covering. Uh, it's just area studies with, uh, with the best minds uh, that we can find to hook them up with. Uh, and we also uh, we send defense correspondents to the National War College. Uh, we send uh, science writers to Woods Hole. Uh, the development of expertise at the Post uh, and at places like the New York Times is just deeper than ever before. We have smarter people with more knowledge covering the news than ever before. The, uh, the profession is also more professional than ever before, despite the fact that we still make mistakes as human beings, putting out a newspaper 365 days a year. I liken to if Ford Motors produced uh, 365 new cars every year and that they began in the morning with designing the car and they, in the afternoon, figured out how they're going to manufacture the car. And at 11 o'clock that night, the car rolled off the assembly line. And the next day, they started with a totally different model from scratch. That's what we do every day. And as a result, mistakes are made. And uh, uh, those mistakes are often loomed very large. But uh, you might misunderstand from them sometimes that the profession is much more professional than it ever has been. There are more professional organizations than ever before. There is more uh, training within the profession than ever before. Uh, so that the, uh, the, the people who want to spend the money uh, and who have the value systems to produce better news than ever before are able to do so. Um, also on that side of the ledger is new technology. Just a couple years ago, we saw the Internet as a, uh, as, a, as a potential enemy of the news media, something that was going to take away our advertising and take away our audience. Now we see it as an integral part of our business. WashingtonPost.com, our particular Internet site, is part of the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, we, we share a lot of uh, uh, news gathering uh, and news production in ways that I'll talk about in, in a little while when I get back to the Internet. Uh, but it really makes possible much better news coverage uh, than ever before. And it makes it possible for people anywhere in the United States and anywhere in the world to read the very best news coverage every single day. It used to be that if you lived in Iowa or someplace like that, no offense to anybody who lives there, and you weren't satisfied with your local newspaper, that's what you were stuck with. If they didn't cover foreign affairs, you didn't read about foreign affairs. Now, if you have a computer and a modem, you can read New York Times and Washington Post coverage of foreign affairs. And you can also read the London Times coverage of England and, uh, uh, and an Indian newspaper's coverage of India and so on. Uh, so that it actually makes possible for people to be better informed about the world about them uh, than ever before. Those are the things in the good side of the ledger. On the worrisome side of the ledger, we begin with ownership, who I, I talked about earlier. An increasing uh, 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 proportion of American news media are owned by large, publicly traded corporations uh, whose primary interest is not in the quality of the news coverage they produce, but rather in uh, supplying for Wall Street uh, the earnings, uh, the uh, quarterly earnings increases that are demanded in order to keep their stock prices up high, which rewards their executives, including their editors, in stock options uh, that, that makes them rich people. Uh, for our book, we, Bob Kaiser, uh, my colleague, the former managing editor of the Washington Post, and I interviewed a number of editors uh, across the country. And we interviewed a bunch of them at the American Society of Newspaper Editors Convention in Washington last year. And one of those editors, um, the editor of the Minneapolis Tribune, said, look around here at this meeting, and you will find probably 100 millionaires. Uh, editors who, through their stock options, through uh, the money they made when their newspaper was acquired by a larger newspaper corporation, became millionaires based on their share of the profits of these corporations. And he asked, what incentive do they have 
to produce quality journalism if it's going to interfere with or conflict with the money they can make as, as big stockholders in this corporation? And that's a good and difficult question. Uh, what book was written a few years ago by the then editor of the Chicago Tribune, uh, in which he said that he was bought, essentially, by uh, the, uh, the large amounts of money he was able to make in the Tribune Corporation, which made him, in his mind, compromise on important questions between the business side and the news side of the newspaper, uh, because his pocketbook fattened when the, uh, when the profits went up, uh, even if that was at the expense of, uh, of, uh, of covering the news. The, the conflict there is that the, the, the two, two largest um, expenses of any newspaper are the newsprint that the newspaper is printed on and the salaries of the people who work there. Uh, and uh, because of technology, the production side of newspapers uh, has been shrinking. Uh, the computers have replaced the people who used to set the type. Uh, it, uh, the computer-operated uh, presses have made it possible to run the presses with far less people than used to be. So all that money has been saved uh, in newspapers that are trying to cut costs to maximize profits. And the only place left to cut salaries is in the newsroom is by holding down or even uh, uh, shrinking uh, the size of newsroom staffs. And the only, way, the only other way to, to, to uh, cut costs in a dramatic way is to shrink the amount of pages in the newspaper in order to save on newsprint costs. And both of those things affect news coverage. And the vast majority of the papers in this country, beginning with the 1991 recession, which hit newspapers very hard in a surprising way uh, and threatened uh, the um, extraordinary profitability that newspapers have historically had, 20 to 25 percent profits for many newspapers, 30 to 40 percent profits by newspapers owned by certain chains like the, like the Gannett Company, uh, they're just used to those really high profits, which are 8, 10, 20 times the profits you would expect in almost any other business in this country. Uh, uh, in order to maintain those profits during a recession, when advertising fell dramatically, they began cutting newsroom costs and they began cutting the news hole, the space in the newspaper in which to print the news. And as a result, we've seen news coverage in papers all across the country become significantly less good than it was before. Uh, another big cost for a newsroom is obviously if you're going to try to cover foreign affairs. It used to be it was cheap to have foreign correspondence. Living costs were significantly cheaper around the world in the United States. It's now exactly the opposite. It uh, costs us um, roughly 20 times as much to maintain a correspondent in Tokyo than to maintain a correspondent in Washington, D.C. So again, many of these newspaper chains and those newspapers outside the really large ones that had foreign correspondents eliminated them or shrunk them down to you know, one or two or three who can't possibly cover the whole world anymore. Uh, and, the, and the television networks have done the same thing. The television networks went through a number of ownership changes, I think probably best chronicled in the book Three Blind Mice uh, by Kenaletta, uh, in which they moved from their old family ownership, the families that founded them, and the families that spent lavishly on news coverage because this was important to their self-esteem, and also they felt it was important to the, um, uh, the special uh, legal position they held uh, uh, you know, to avoid government regulation that they uh, would find onerous uh, to cover the news in, uh, in, in an ostentatiously uh, expensive and high-class and high class way. Uh, but then as those companies became uh, bought, they sold out to uh, corporations in which they were just a cog in a much larger machine. Uh, that uh, that interest in spending that much money on news has gone by the wayside. So we've seen really drastic cuts in the news operations of the major networks, uh, so that, and also particularly in their overseas operations. Uh, most of the television networks now have, uh, have only a few foreign bureaus, and then they send people from those bureaus. For instance, London is usually the bureau of choice for all of Europe for the big uh, networks. And so if a story breaks, say, in Germany, they send a reporter from London who's not been following that story regularly because he's not based in Germany, who parachutes in the day before he appears on the nightly news the next night. That does not give him very much time to provide the depth and context that you'd want in covering that story well and the kind that the networks used to provide. The other thing that's happened throughout the newspaper industry is um, uh, intertwined with cultural changes in this country, something that my colleague and I are wrestling with as we work on this book. What's the chicken and egg here? What, what came first? As the country has become more oriented towards entertainment, uh, as we've all become much more interested in celebrities, and uh, we've essentially achieved a celebrity culture in which even ordinary news people have become celebrities since Watergate, uh, amazingly enough. Um, uh, the uh, 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 people who run 
television stations, television networks, and newspapers are worried that their audience will shrink uh, or is shrinking if they are not able to uh, add into their news coverage entertaining news, entertaining coverage. And that means covering celebrities more, that means doing more light features, more fluffy things. And in fact, you see in the network news that they've almost completely abandoned the subject of the talk here being news media and public affairs. They, they've, they've greatly shrunk their coverage of public affairs, government, foreign affairs, those sorts of things, business, uh, in favor of much lighter coverage, but also in some cases, to give them credit, as Tom Brokaw argued with Bob and me when we interviewed him for our book, uh, subjects that were not thought by sort of stuffy white males in the past to be news that we know in fact are news, um, such as uh, medicine um, and um, uh, um, uh, thinking, right now, thinking now some of the more kind of social, social issues kind of coverage, excuse me? Education, Education is a good one, right. Uh, food and, and things like that that weren't traditionally thought of as news are in fact news. Uh, although if you watch carefully those broadcasts, they cover those also in a rather light top kind of entertaining uh, uh, top of the uh, iceberg um, um, sort of way. Uh, so that the, uh, w when we interviewed the three anchors uh, for our book, we took with us, we warned them we were going to do this, we took to each one of them a tape of one of the broadcasts they did during their first year as anchor. So for each of them that's about two decades ago. Uh, and it was an entirely different newscast. I of course remember, I'm old enough to remember these newscasts, uh, which were filled with stories out of Washington, with foreign stories, the reporters were reporters who, were, who had worked a long time on those subjects, were experts in their fields, uh, some of whom are now anchors today and, and otherwise uh, well known in the, the celebrities in television today, but back then were the working reporters in television and who were based, you know, who spent time on Capitol Hill. We saw one story about uh, uh, the beginning of a new administration and what was going on on the Hill, and they were actually a number of congressmen and senators interviewed. You will not see that today. And, on the nightly news or the CBS evening news because that is thought of to be dead time. Uh, and uh, Dan Rather, uh, who was a foreign correspondent himself and who's broadcast uh, 20 some years ago was filled with foreign news, told us he is not allowed to mention the word foreign on the air by his bosses because that's an automatic turnoff. People will click the clicker they believe and turn to another station. He talks gingerly about international news but even tries to avoid that. Instead he tries to talk about the subject of the story hoping that will be the hook uh, that will keep people watching a story from overseas. This is, this is how people are thinking currently uh, in network television. Uh, yeah, similarly, in local television news, which uh, uh, had originally uh, been, uh, uh, in fact, was uh, the, the FCC requirements for having a t local television broadcasting license included public service. And that was interpreted to mean, among other things, uh, local news coverage and particularly coverage of civic affairs, government and civic affairs. Uh, that's no longer being policed uh, any, any longer as a condition of licensing in most cases. Uh, and similarly, in the battle for ratings, uh, in a world in which there are many more channels than there used to be, uh, local television uh, news directors are looking for the kinds of entertaining visual news, it must be visual, that will attract uh, people to an evening news broadcast. That's why the 11 o'clock news always begins with crime, because that's what they feel will keep people who just watched a crime show from 10 to 11 watching that news show when it starts at 11 o'clock as a feed-in from that. Uh, the, uh, the local news directors I talked to when we're working on the book it's told me that similarly if they have Oprah as the lead-in show to their evening news, they begin with stories about women uh, to begin their broadcast in a kind of condescending, sexist way uh, in order to hold that women audience. If on the other hand they have, uh, who's the guy that they have fights on his show and stuff all the time? Jerry, Jerry Springer. They know that they have a young male audience and they begin the that early evening news with crime in order to hold that young male audience and, and early sports. Uh, so it's, it's entirely geared towards ratings. The ratings are now broken down. It's, I, saw these, I, I, I saw these rating sheets that they get. They're broken down by 15-minute segments. In some cases, five-minute segments if you want to pay enough for it. Uh, and, and that way you're, you can actually tell which stories appear to be keeping people watching your station or watching another station. And this is what the news directors pour over. They don't sit around talking about whether or not they're covering uh, you know, local government sufficiently or whether or not they're investigating um, conditions in the community that need correcting or whether or not they're pre pre presenting good examples of, uh, of things going on in the community that people ought to know about. Instead, they're talking about uh, the ratings for this particular 15-minute segment and what they need to beef them up. It's interesting. The, um, 
uh, many city, most cities have at least an hour of local news now, and, some more, and actually an hour and a half is the average now, and some range up to three hours of local evening news in between the afternoon shows and the, and the prime time shows. And uh, no matter how long that, that, that uh, uh, window is of local news, they cover usually just the same number of stories, and it's seldom more than a dozen. Uh, which would be uh, you know, a small fraction of the stories in the local newspaper. And what they do is just keep updating those stories over and over again, and they preview them, and then they show it to you at 5 o'clock, and then they preview it, and they show you another version of it at 5.30. Uh, they spend most of their money not on uh, the reporters themselves and on the news gathering, but rather on getting the cameras to a location uh, where they can put their reporters on live. Because again, they believe that's what engages people in local television news, is to see the person live on the scene. Never mind that the person was arrested and taken to the police station at 10 o'clock in the morning. They still need to be there at 7 o'clock at night, standing in front of the police station, saying, this morning, so-and-so was brought into the police station behind me uh, to be charged with murder in the you know, celebrated uh, local case. Uh, and, the, and this is the most uh, local television reporters spend most of their days not out on the street interviewing people or watching city council meetings. Uh, instead, they spend it in a van, moving around from one location to another. Uh, to present that story. The amount of reporting that goes into local television story shocked me. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very little. It's, all, it's, it's any one of you could get into one of those vans right now and go out onto a story and you would find out as much as a trained television reporter would find out and they'll put the same amount on the air. The only reason they wouldn't put you on the air instead of that reporter is that you don't know how to behave on the air. You don't know how to project yourself uh, in order to be entertaining uh, to the television audience. So these are the influences that worry me about the future of, of, uh, of, uh, of news coverage uh, and the future of the news media. Uh, then along comes uh, uh, technology in the form of the internet, uh, which as I said earlier offers uh, a lot of good news, I think, for the future of news, news coverage. Uh, for one thing, because it can, it, it, it makes uh, the best news coverage accessible to more people. And uh, for those of us who figured this out after first being frightened about the internet, it, it, make, it makes it possible not only for us to project Washington Post journalism out to many more readers than we would have otherwise. We've gained hundreds of thousands every day of new readers of the Washington Post on the internet around the country and around the world. Uh, but also we have found that we can um, expand our coverage of the news itself using the internet. Because what our reporters now do in our newsroom is during the course of the day if a story breaks, they can uh, uh, write a story sooner and put it on the internet without waiting for tomorrow morning's newspaper. Later in the day, then they write the story for the next morning's newspaper. So that their journalism can be more current than it is. We, uh, uh, Steve called the managing editor of the Post, has christened this our back to the future strategy, back to the days even before my time when there were morning and evening newspapers in most cities, and in some cases the, a, a, a newspaper had both morning and evening editions. So reporters were writing versions of the story all day long, and that's to some extent what they're doing now. Uh, to maintain our quality, uh, we have added reporters and added editors uh, so that we do not have um, reporters uh, putting stories on the net uh, that are not fully reported and not well written uh, up to our standards. Obviously, the stories can be shorter because most stories on the internet are shorter uh, that are done just directly for the internet. But this particularly served us well during the election campaign when our political reporters, and, and, and during the 36 days after the election, during that long recount, when news events were breaking all day long and public interest in what was going on was so terribly high uh, and the cable television networks were on all day and you could watch news break on them. But our, our reporters then were, who were covering the story in Florida and in Washington were able to uh, keep up with the news as it happened. A Supreme Court decision would be announced. We could put the decision itself, the full text of it, on the internet immediately as soon as it was released by the court. And our Supreme Court reporter and our political reporters could analyze the decision in the next hour or so and produce a story on the internet, uh, and sometimes more than one story, uh, that had the depth and context of a Washington Post story, but more, more immediately than waiting for the next morning's newspaper. In a sense, we are putting together the print cycle and the broadcast cycle of news coverage, but with greater depth than uh, broadcast and more immediacy than newspapers. Uh, and we discovered it worked uh, during the political campaign. Uh, we, we did not make any terrible mistakes. There was nothing we put up in the net that we regretted later. Uh, we had one reporter, a senior political reporter, assigned full time to constantly update the running story each day. So that was his job, and he would be in touch with all of our other reporters to have information fed into him uh, 
uh, to enable him to make that story as current as it could be all day long. And that way we had quality control. He's a knowledgeable political reporter, uh, and he was able to um, uh, deal with that information in a, in a, in a knowledgeable way uh, and put it together in an intelligible way for the readers of, of the Internet. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the potential problems with the Internet obviously are that people would rush stories onto it uh, that, aren't, that haven't been fully vent, uh, uh, vented. Uh, by, vetted by, uh, uh, by editors, and they would make mistakes. This happened briefly during uh, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, if you recall. Both the Wall Street Journal and another uh, uh, serious newspaper, I forget which one, uh, Dallas Morning News, uh, put stories up on the Internet that were, that were not confirmed at the time they went up on the Internet. Uh, in both cases, well, actually one of them never was proven to be true. Another one uh, was, was headed in the right direction, we found out, after much reporting over many weeks and months later. But at the time that they rushed it onto the Internet, uh, the story was not confirmed, it was not solid, they had to retract it later. And I think we all learned from that. We all learned that we need to make sure that we are testing the accuracy and the fairness of a story that's going on the web, just as we do for any story that's going in the newspaper. And the people who actually run the site, WashingtonPost.com, most of whom are former editors and reporters from our newsroom, who are, who are web-friendly people who are able to handle that new medium, uh, are, are in agreement with us about our standards. Uh, and so they, they uh, defer to us. We do not put a story up on WashingtonPost.com until we think it's uh, ready, no matter how um, urgent it may feel to, to get it out there in front of that, uh, in front of that readership. Uh, the other uh, factor I'll talk about, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about election coverage and quit so you can ask questions, is, there, is the overall fragmentation of the media. Again, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a positive to that in that there are more choices now than ever before. If the th big three networks have cut back in their foreign operations, CNN has, has uh, provided uh, has more uh, foreign correspondence than any network ever had. Now, they're not, they're not of the same quality. Um, uh, because they get paid less and their backgrounds are not as good, but they're out there. And it's, uh, the value of CNN is that you can watch uh, news anywhere in the world as it's happening. You can watch the, uh, you know, the news unfold. And sometimes it's a, you know, a little jerky as their correspondents standing in front of an event unfolding behind them are trying to figure out what it is that they're in front of and seeing. Uh, and, uh, and they sometimes make mistakes, but over the course of a few hours, uh, the story emerges, which is better than not having a correspondent there at all. Uh, for television. Uh, similarly, the Internet has a myriad of sites of uh, various kinds, including many that started up on the Internet covering uh, very narrow aspects of the news, S sites that specialize in sports, sites that specialize in business news, um, and sites that specialize in news of interest to women, sites that specialize in uh, of news of importance to people in the military and veterans, for example. Um, at, at first, we thought that the great promise of the Internet was that anybody could be a publisher on the Internet, sort of back to colonial times, taking advantage of the First Amendment in a really robust way. All you need is a server and a computer, and you can, you can be a news operation on the Internet. Uh, what's happened is that um, uh, two things. Uh, those that uh, never really had any money behind them, nobody pays any attention to. And, uh, and if you don't have uh, resources to do news reporting, by and large, your site's nothing more than your opinion or your view of a little world where you are, and you can find those kind of sites in the Internet if you look hard for them. Uh, the ones that did raise money, either through stock offerings when the Internet was hot, uh, or angels or investors of various kinds, uh, found that they then had to maintain both quality of news coverage on the Internet and a large audience in order to keep the money coming. Uh, because so far, advertising the Internet is not as great. Advertising revenue is not nearly as great as it is in other forms of media so far because advertisers aren't yet sure how to use the Internet and so are not yet willing to spend as much money on it. So a number of these better-funded news organizations on the Internet, Internet startups, some of which were quite good in their own areas, something called AF, no, a, APB.com, which covered crime and courts was actually quite interesting, hired a lot of very good investigative reporters and court reporters from major newspapers. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, Voter.com, uh, which uh, hired uh, um, some very good political reporters and political columnists, uh, found that uh, they could not sustain their operations because they couldn't bring in the revenue to cover those costs, and they've gone out of business or become little shells of themselves, and, and those, those nice staffs that they assembled uh, are now dispersed. So what's happened is that the Internet news sites that draw the largest audiences and draw the most advertising revenue and have the best site chances of succeeding in the future are, in fact, 
the new media sites of the old media. It's msnbc.com, abc.com, washingtonpost.com, newyorktimes.com, etc. The one exception to that are the so-called portals, uh, Yahoo and um, uh, Microsoft, MSN, uh, and so on, uh, which do not do any news coverage of their own. Instead, what they provide uh, is, uh, is Associated Press news, uh, the wire service news. So if you want, you can keep yourself you know, sort of generally up to date on that. It's very reliable news coverage. It doesn't have much depth to it. It doesn't have uh, a lot of enterprise to it, uh, never mind investigative reporting. Uh, but it is, uh, is very reliable news coverage, so you can keep yourself informed. And the portals have the largest audiences of all on the Internet because that's most, way, most people's way into the Internet. Uh, AOL is another one, obviously. So what they provide is wire service news that you can go to if you want. Uh, but increasingly also they are linking to the other uh, old media news brands. So you can get to the Washington Post, for instance, by going to um, uh, Yahoo if you want. Uh, and uh, and uh, a particularly interesting and singular phenomenon is Matt Drudge, the Drudge Report. Uh, the, what, what Drudge puts up from his own reporting is, of course, um, exciting because sometimes it's on the money and he gets something early from his sources inside uh, news-making organizations like political parties and sometimes inside news organizations themselves where he's managed to charm or pay young people into telling them what, what that news organization's working on. And sometimes it's spectacularly wrong. It's gossip in a newsroom or gossip in a White House office that turns out to be absolutely wrong. So you never know what Drudge himself is doing. It's going to be accurate or not. And if that was all he was doing, nobody would be reading the Drudge Report anymore. I think the reason why the Drudge Report has succeeded is that he has a very good eye for everybody else's news coverage. And so most of the Drudge Report is actually not his own stuff. And instead, it's headlines and stories that he calls through his reading of the Internet from other news organizations. As a result, the number one place where we get traffic from that doesn't come directly to WashingtonPost.com but comes from another Internet site is from the Drudge Report because he loves Washington Post reporting and he refers to it all the time and people come through his links to our site. Because we have an arrangement with msnbc.com, an agreement with them, where we trade um, the content. And we thought that would be our number one driver of traffic from outside our site. And it turns out it's only number two to the Drudge Report. Uh, that's probably enough to say right now, I think. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming.